All right, welcome back. Episode 7 of the Young Old Heads podcast. We're excited to have everyone back here for another episode talking about cards. Uh, I'm here with my co-host, Max, aka Cards Max. How are you doing, Max? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm ready to jump right into it. We have a special guest yeah. today. Yeah, we do. Well, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Tommy, T- at, aka TV Sports Cards. Uh, we're, we're excited this week, uh, Max. We've We've gotten a really good response the last couple of weeks to a new logo that we've came out with for the podcast. And uh, we're here right now with the artist behind the, the genius behind the logo, Charles LeBonge. Charles, how are you doing, man? Oh, man. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm uh, happy to join you guys on a beautiful Sunday morning over here in L.A. And uh, I'm ready to talk some cards with you guys. I'm so excited. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, we uh, this is our second straight week where we got a three uh, time zone podcast going on. You're out there in L.A. Uh, you want to tell the people what uh, what you do and kind of what you collect? Uh, so I am a designer by trade and a little bit of an artist, designer, artist, do multimedia, everything. Um, I like to collect Dodgers straight up. I'm, I'm an L.A. cat through and through, so I don't really dabble in any other teams like that because I don't really know them that well like unless it's a huge name you know like tatis acuna all that stuff but um dodgers if they wear in blue then or if they're in blue now so like freddie trey turner like i would collect their old cards but yeah uh, so so, yeah so you wouldn't so your strategy with guys they pick up like vets you would be you would collect their older rookie card stuff not their dodger blue uniform stuff well when bets came to the team that was like the height of my collecting phase and yeah. so I, I was too impatient to wait for uh, dodgers cards of his and like what was it series two of 2020 was when he came out yeah. so i just was trying i was saving up for his rookies and stuff and then now they've taken off and i kind of missed the boat on that but yeah i remember we uh so for the listeners back home i am a huge giants fan as everyone knows charles <laughs> a huge dodgers fan we you know, came together early on in both our times, I think, on Twitter in the, like 2020 and just kind of linked up. We were in some group chats together uh, just as like young guys who are collecting, collecting baseball stuff. Uh, so, Max, you want to tell the people what our inspiration was behind the logo and kind of what uh, what our ideas were we threw to Luke Charles? Yeah. So I want to make sure it's 1955 Bowman. That's yes, right. 1955 yeah. Bowman. So the 1955 Bowman has the stylization of each card in a television set. I am redoing the pose of Mickey Mantle's card, while Tommy is redoing uh, Willie Mays' position on his card. And the red with the logo is from Topps Chrome. And I thought the clashing of that, you know, give the ideas to Charles. He works his magic and it truly is magic because it takes a lot of innovation with that and we have this masterpiece of a logo right in front of our eyes yeah yeah Matt, i i really want to say that like the ideas we gave to charles were very uh unstructured we were kind of just like 1955 bowman but we kind of like that design so charles you want to say like kind of like what your thought process was with like how you try to mix in what we were trying to give you Oh, man, to be honest, that my thought process was almost as crazy as yours. I was just thinking, like, what can we do to make it different? And like, like you've been talking, we, when we talk, like you, I appreciate you enjoying my art and my art style. And to, to, be, to be able to actually do one for you now mm-hmm. is like a really, it was a really big deal for me. And it was also a big challenge to uh, like to, to take the card format, squeeze it to the profile picture format. And also keep the integrity of the 55 Bowman, which yeah. I thought we did. I thought we did a good job. Your guys' poses were incredible. Yeah. And, uh, I really enjoyed like building you guys up. And then when I took a look, took a step back to look at it, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's Tommy and that's Max right there. That that's pretty good, I think. So it was it was fun for me. It was a good challenge. Um, Max, thanks again for pointing out the red logo. I think that was perfect. Yeah. It holds. It looks great. It's amazing. So um, it was yeah. just such a fun process. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I'm I'm glad you had as much fun with it as we did because you know what what me and Max are trying to do with this podcast and what we kind of wanted to get represented with the logo is just like that we res- we have a lot of deep respect for the history of the hobby. In like 1955 Bowman, I think is one of the more iconic designs. You know, I'm not going to say it's the most iconic. You know, people have their own thoughts on that, but trying to merge that with the Topps Chrome logo font kind of thing with like the new new era. The fact that we want to like 
acknowledge and respect the history of card collecting while, you know, trying to bring a new perspective to it and kind of merge the two waves of collecting um, is kind of what we were going for. And I can't, re I literally can't imagine a better looking logo than what you came up with. So I, I'm uh, internally grateful for you, man. And whenever we make a Young Old Heads merch, you'll be the first one to get it. And if you, we will be making shirts. So if anyone wants a shirt and wants me to include you in the order, just hit me up on uh, Twitter, Instagram, at TV Sports Cards. We'll, uh, we'll make it happen. But uh, Charles, you have another hobby that I think is really interesting and the one that you have just began to merge a little bit into card collecting as well. So do you want to, you're into cars, oh, vintage cars. Uh, do you want to tell the people what your, what the backstory is with your, your hobby with vintage cars? Yeah. So um, it was kind of like, uh, well, in January of 2021, my dad unfortunately passed away. Um, I'm sorry. But uh, thank you. But it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's you know, you grow. There's a lot of growth and everything. But one thing he did leave for me was his uh, 1971 Chevrolet Impala convertible, which is just this. It's 19 feet long. It takes up the entire garage. It's just this huge boat that like isn't economically like sound at all like in today's age, especially with the gas prices. But it's a beauty to drive. And so I just love cruising through L.A. And like it's it's just my therapy for me. And so most of my money was going to caring for the car. And so that's where my cards kind of took a little bit of a pause or a plateau. And then just a couple of weeks ago, I was like, oh, man, I wonder if they ever just, you know, made car cards or something. And then yeah. I looked it up. And in 1976, they actually made. Uh, cars of 1977 so this is the same car i have just six years uh younger this is a 77 impala yeah from and, the 76 tops i believe right this is yeah so 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 for the people listening charles is holding up a 1976 tops tan and impala coupe car card which is honestly really cool looking it looks very 70s so the design is sick um I, Charles, the reason why I love this and what me and Max kind of talk about is like, that's something I do all the time on eBay is just like anything that I'm interested in, not like not related to cards, like any sort of artist, musician, like any sort of anything that I'm interested in, I'll just see if they have cards. And I love your, your passion for your vintage, your car, you know, uh, what is it called again when you're like redo cars? Uh, restoration. Your restoration. Yeah. Your restoration of the vintage cars with, you know. Hey, cars take up a lot of space. Cards with a D, they don't take up that much space. Um, do you plan on picking up any more or anything? Most definitely, yeah. Um, I'm trying to re reevaluate how I collect, um, mainly because Corey Seager was my favorite player on the Dodgers. And I spent a lot of money on his cards, and I was really excited. And then when he left to Texas, it just broke my heart. And like I know the money and everything, all of that aside – like, I just, like I said, I can't get around it. Like, he's not on the Dodgers anymore, so I don't have that atten uh, attachment to cards like that. So I'm trying to redirect towards, um, honestly, like, vintage would be, like, one great avenue, I think, because that's established. Or, like, bigger players like Mookie, who's going to be in L.A. for the foreseeable future, and Kershaw, who's at the latter half. Even if he does go somewhere for one year, I mean, like, I know that he's a Dodger for life. So yeah, for sure. I think I, I would love to see what future car like uh, vintage stuff you pick up because I think I think vintage stuff, especially the weird stuff like the cars and stuff is just like, that's just fun, man. Like that's just pieces of history. And it, 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 it's, it's really hard to like fault buying something like that for any amount of money. It's like, this is an old thing. They're not making more of these. This is also connects with your, 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 you know, your father, the car, you know, I think <clears throat> That's what, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what collecting is all about and something that me and Max always talk about. But <clears throat> Max, do you have any uh, questions for Charles about his Dodgers PC? I know your Yankees uh, mm -hmm. thought process is pretty similar to his Dodgers thought process. Yeah. So when I'm trying to decide a player to collect, I want to ensure that they are on my team. And not just that, but they've been on my team for their entire career. And I try to also do this the few times that I do buy cards of the Knicks. But with the Yankees, um, they, there's a lot of changing and moving parts all the time. So when I was really focusing on who I want to collect, it's, I was thinking, okay, either Gleyber Torres or Luis Severino or Aaron Judge. I tried to get rid of, you know, and not buy Didi Gregorius, Aaron Hicks, 
uh, Mark Teixeira to an extent because I knew, okay, these players signed or were joined in the Yankees not for their entire career. I don't want to risk them leaving. And, of course, with Corey Seager, Corey Seager was a Dodger for his entire career until going to the Texas Rangers. So I haven't had that sort of crisis with what do I do with my PC or my PC player after they change teams. I just try to avoid it by all means possible, but sometimes that can't be done. Seriously, you got to play it safe when you can, but sometimes those uh, GMs over at the teams are pretty ruthless. Yeah, I, and I think that even makes like Kershaw an even more attractive player because Kershaw has already, not only has he already given the Dodgers so many years, if he happened to leave the Dodgers for any reason, he still has that legacy in Los Angeles to where there's still a deep attachment to probably a lot of fans and to the city itself. But once you have that sort of commitment to a team, it's hard to let go of it. Most definitely. And it's interesting because Kenley Jansen is like another player who is on the Dodgers the entire time. But I think of his collection, like I still wouldn't buy his cards though necessarily. Yeah. Just because he he had a huge impact in LA, but just not enough for me in, in the sense that like, compared to Kershaw, but they're yeah. both lifelong Dodgers up until this point. Yeah. And part of it is a balance between between the two. One of my first real, like, PCs was Dallin Batances, you know, re- over-hulking reliever for the Yankees and really, you know, the dominant setup man for the longest time. And I loved him growing up in high school, and I loved that he was from New York, that he was a Yankee. And then he became a Met, and that totally turned me <laughs> off. I'm glad I wasn't, like, totally, like, invested in him from an emotional or financial standpoint. But seeing – a uh, homegrown player leave is just always heartbreaking. Oh, Even yeah. if it's not like a guy like Kershaw to where his stuff is maintaining value no matter what, especially when it's lower PC guys and there's not too much of a market to offload it or not even many fans, it gets more difficult. Oh, for sure. I have a lot of mid-level relief pitchers that were on the Dodgers just because I like, I love the team. So I want cards of everybody. So yeah, I got, you know, I got a Mother's Day parallel of AJ Pollock now that I, I don't know what I'm going to do. With. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel that with the Giants, like when they were winning rings, I was I was obsessed with their relief pitchers like Jeremy Alfelt is a name that I just like that dude was so nasty. And he just he we would never have won those rings without him. But it's like, do I re- should I really be spending money on his cards? Probably not. Like, don't be around for like I can pick those up whenever in the future if I really want to and have the more capacity to do so. Uh, but what you guys were just talking about made me think about something that I sometimes tell people, which is about this l- uh, metaphorical line that I have for guys if they contribute enough to my team that that warrants me picking up a couple cards of them. Uh, for me, I'm now realizing talking to you guys, I my bar is so low. <laughs> my bar for like contributions to my favorite teams that you have to make for me to pick up a card or two of your of your got every stuff is very low. I call it the D'Angelo Russell line. Uh, it's for the Warriors. So if, if, if he was only on the Warriors for about like a few months and ended up getting traded for Wiggins, but he is the bar for me. If you contribute more than D'Angelo Russell contributed to the Warriors, I will buy some of your cards. Uh, some guys I want to specifically shout out that I don't think you guys would collect if you were fans of the teams that I'm fans of. Uh, Cody Ross. Uh, uh, Here's another good one. Well, uh, the Warriors have a bunch of guys like Sean Livingston probably is like the equivalent of like a middle reliever for basketball. Uh, he was amazing. Would not have won the rings without him or like David West. Uh, so I, that's me. I My bar is much lower than your guys' bar, but I know that I respect the way you guys collect. And I think, I think having these like reflections all the time about, do I really want to keep holding this card? Do I really still want this card? Uh, is stuff that you should just always ask yourself as a collector in general, for sure. But uh, Charles, you're... We haven't talked enough about your art, so I want to I want to bring up something that you did in 2020. Uh, you, everyone, Max is a huge Project 2020 head. Uh, he he was really into it. But I will say the coolest cards I've seen that were created in 2020 were by our man right here, Charles Abon. So Charles, you want to tell us about your project that you did and kind of what your what you did and some of your favorite ones? Oh man, yeah. So I actually <laughs> got the play right in front of me. So that was um, that was like my first big project i had just finished college at the university of san francisco up by you go down yeah we're going to run to the ncaa tournament next year hopefully but uh so that was like my first big project it was um i don't know what it was i saw somebody's bob gibson card and i was like man that'd be kind of cool to just recreate 
you know? And yeah. so I have done that before. Like my first illustrations that I did were athletic sports illustrations. It was of DeMar DeRozan when he was on the Raptors. Nice. He's my favorite player. So <laughs> I had an experience with, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say he's an LA guy, big LA guy. Yeah, yeah, LA guy all the way. I got his high school jersey too from Compton High. So it's it's all the way. Um, so I had some experience like building building people on Illustrator like that. And so I just did it. And then I, I don't know what it was. I just figured like, why not print this out and put it together? And I posted it and it kind of got some traction. And then um, it was one, it wasn't until I did a Tony Gwynn was my second card. And like, there's a lot of big fans of his on uh, Twitter. So that's when I really immersed myself into the community, I would say. Like I was in the community but that's when my name really kind of spread around to a yeah. certain section yeah. and so i just rolled off that momentum like the the excitement of the feedback that i'd get from people i just keep going and so it's uh and obviously i saved the dodgers for last because i just wanted to make sure that they were the most special but yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah for sure i think your cards, your cards are, are very beautiful cards. Uh, what's your website called? Just for people back Thank home. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, Charles Labonge Design. So my name design.com. It's cool. available on my Twitter, which is at uh, Club08, which is a little bit more. No, we'll put it. We'll put it all in the description of the episode, awesome. so people will be able to find it. But um, <clears throat> this is really unique because I, you literally made these cards. These cards are physically printed. Do you want to tell us about like what's the process from like idea? to create the design to printing and what was like the biggest hurdle for you along the way? Like what, what is that like? It was, it was a really good lesson for me in terms of the design process from idea to production. So I'd start with a little sketch and then I'd see how I can incorporate different uh, elements of the, of like my little splash that I want to put on the card. And then I, <clears throat> excuse me, I just hit the ground running on uh illustrator so the toughest part was honestly producing the cards themselves because uh if sometimes the printing i'd print them and then i'd have to glue them to some cardboard and like anywhere in that process the glue could be too much and stain the, the paper or when i'm cutting like the ruler slips and then i lose six cards on that one sheet and so it was just um it was fun and it was super awesome to like Put the whole process together but uh it was a lot of work so yeah damn man i i that's some real meticulous work and that's why i think it really comes through though like i have i i think i have four of your cards i have uh the big red machine one with joe morgan and johnny bench i got the willie mccovey and will clark and i'm trying to forget what the last one is but these cards feel real they feel like any other tops produced card um so uh, whatever you're doing making them uh i know it takes a lot of work from you and i uh, I, I just want to say that it really comes through. And I think that, you know, I, I would love it if you kept doing them. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on doing more cards in the future, but like, uh, I know if like LEDX, if we're ever trying to do some like design stuff or anything cool with like partnerships, I'm definitely going to hit you up first because I respect what you did. And uh, I really encourage, do you have any more of these cards sitting around or are they kind of all gone and sold? 100%. No, I have um, all the Project 2020 cards. Those are those have been dispersed pretty much. I think I still got like one Willie Mays card. If you don't have it, man, I'll have to send it to you. Oh, yeah, I need that. Yeah, a, for sure. I would love that. I have actually a Willie Mays and I have a Don Mattingly. So, Max, I could just send that one to you if you want. That um, would be very cool. That so would be sick. Like, uh, secure. Those are secure guys who have already had their careers. <laughs> and they, 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 no, no problem. So, yeah. um those are all those are all sent out and spread out throughout the country, which is really fun to think about like that, wherever those cards have landed. Um, but those Johnny Bench, Joe Morgan ones and the Willie McCovey, I have a ton of those left. I have them available on my eBay, which is through my website, too, which we can link up. Yeah, but... we'll, we'll link it out for sure. I want to give one quick shout out here to our homie Mitch at IMO Mitch. Oh, uh, yeah. He's an absolute legend. He actually was the first guy to tell me about your stuff. He was like, yeah, man, I've been like kind of, I don't buy Project 2020, but I've, my this guy Charles has been making cards and I think they're just really cool. Like if he becomes a famous artist, I'm going to keep buying these because like they're really cool cards and they're his first kind of thing. And I'm like, that's dope. And then I found out you're, RA, you're my age and like kind of have a similar thought process on things, man. So I, I'm so glad that we were able to link up and uh, connect in the card world and that we were able to work together on this logo thing because I think 
you know, that's what the hobby is all about, man. It's all about, you know, becoming friends with people, figuring out if there's anything outside of cards that you guys can do together and like helping each other out. So I think you're a great representation of that, Charles. I appreciate you, man. Oh, the sentiment feels the same for you guys. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, being able to connect with some people that I made friends with in a community that was so uh, actually crucial for me at the time in 2020, especially like all that stuff is really yeah. fun. Me actually real quick if you don't mind like i want to kind of talk about that if you're down like i was living at home in 2020 i was just grad we had both just graduated we're the same class like i was that was not where i wanted to be after graduation man like i was not that was never my plan i was not trying to live at home ever again like i wanted my own place i was really not like i was not in a good place mentally and once i got back into cards i was like i'm gonna start going through my binders again let's see what i got here and Finding Twitter, finding like you guys, like you, Logan, Mitch, uh, even our boy Griff. Shout out Griff. Yeah, uh, shout, out. <laughs> shout out Mason. Just like people like that and like the hobby in general, like that really helped me out. And like, I don't think I would have ever like gotten to where I was and felt like as good about where I was in my life without those guys around me. And like well, our conversations, we just like Twitter DMs till like 1am and just kind of like shooting the shit about whatever, man. That was that was a really important time for me, at least. Absolutely. Yeah, it was um, that connection that we had. And like, just the just to be able to like, jump in the rabbit hole of cards together was like, really a uh, fun time. <laughs> for sure. Max, you have any thoughts on that before we let Charles go here? Um, I just love the multifacetedness of Charles, you're collecting and really life living hobby diversity. And I'm glad that cards have bound us together. Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah. That's so kind of you. Well, well, Charles, this won't be the last time you're on the podcast. We'll, oh. we'll, we'll be doing stuff, projects together in the future, I'm sure. And, you know, if, if uh, whenever you're doing something cool, let us know. We'll promote it on here. So I appreciate oh. you, dude. And I hope you have a good rest of your weekend. Likewise, guys. Thank you so much for having me. We'll be in touch. For sure. Thanks for coming and, uh, on, Charles. Yep. I'll Thanks. see you, Charles. Take care. All right. Well, thanks to Charles for uh, hopping on and uh, talking to us about his collection, his his uh, experience making cards. I think Charles is a great guy. Um, I hope we have him on, have him on again. Uh, well, Max, another week of collecting is in the books. Uh, can you tell us one thing you learned? Uh, it's a new segment we're going to have here every week where we're going to say one thing that, me, that we learned from, about the hobby this week. Uh, unofficially titled Card University uh, Lesson 1 today. Uh, Max, what do you got for us? Um, the biggest kind of realization that I had this week is that do not be surprised to have stuff fly when listed appropriately on eBay. Um, I try to, you know, maximize my socials. I enjoy selling on, and even not just selling, existing and engaging with Twitter, Instagram, blowout forms. My slabs is another great platform to sell cards, but I was selling, I, I was a little bit busy with school and life in general for most of April and a good chunk of May, having a little bit of free time this past week in late May to put dedicate time to photos and putting stuff up on eBay. And I churned some sales that I didn't expect to churn. Um, I guess furthermore on this, the stuff that I was selling was a little bit more niche, lower pop stuff. And that's just more stuff that interests me both as a flipper and collector. How, and examples, it, examples, examples. You want you want me to tell? Okay, you want yeah, me to tell them about, tell them what happened specifically with the LeBron. Tell them the LeBron. I had a Magneta, or no, Magenta. I cannot pronounce this color. Oh my god, your I pronunciations, pronounce- your pronunciations are an absolute meme of this podcast. So yes, far. the young old heads. <laughs> but uh, I had a Magenta LeBron James second year Bowman printing plate that I'm thinking. Okay, am I going to keep this? Am I going to sell this? I threw it up on, I mean, I promoted it on social media a little bit to see if there were any, you know, collectors that wanted to get this off me. And even though I bought it on eBay a few months earlier, I just threw it up at a buy it now price. And I took a nap. I woke up from my nap and it was just binned at full price. And it surprised me a little bit. In addition to that, because I did generate two other sales, I had a MetaZoo first edition Grim Reaper PSA 10. And Look, I don't know any MetaZoo followers, but that's <laughs> one of my two flu. And then EV Heroes, you know, Umbreon V, which is also alternate art, which is also something that generally isn't attractive to sports collectors. Is that a Pokemon? It is a, it is a Pokemon, yes. 
All right. But, but you're going to have to educate me on Pokemon at some point. We're going to have to do a full episode on just Pokemon. Mm-hmm. But can I can I say one bit about the LeBron real quick? Um, I think for the economic thing is going on behind your LeBron. So you bought that LeBron for 400 on eBay if you, like a month ago or something, right? want to say it was like March or April. Yeah, so it's been a minute. But that sale is still in the record. So like if someone's looking up a card, they still see it. But as a printing plate 101, you know, those aren't moving consistently at all. At all. So the fact that you got that for 400, which I told you to buy because I thought that was a good deal. And then you put it up for a thousand and someone bought, bought it now, even with that sale in the record somewhere. I think that shows what that shows about the market and the hobby at large is just like rare shit of the goats is always going to be in demand. And your asking price when, especially with a card like a printing plate or it's a one-on-one and it's not going to pop up again, you know, you're going to have people come through and, you know, buy it now in two hours when you don't even really expect it to move at all. So I think that's the lesson to learn there. Take yeah. your, take your rare shit to a bigger market. And part of my thinking was even buying the card at the time was that, okay, this it was a you know, second year LeBron, 2004. I think like a base paper PSA 10 sell out, sells for like $300. So I'm thinking, well, I can get the printing plate one of one for $400. That just sounds like a great deal, let alone like flipping otherwise, you know, selling. It's like, I feel like this is just tremendous untapped value. And I think building off of that even more, When we see, you know, people, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of corollaries saying, oh, the card market is like the stock market being told, oh, you know, you should, no, I agree. I, I, you know, Tommy's shaking his head. I strongly disagree with that statement, but I do think something that we're seeing is that when we initially had like a crash in, want to say very early, like February, 2021, base paper, base Chrome PSA tens are becoming worthless and overrun, which was very predictable. And people are crying a little bit now and saying, oh, nothing's booming, you know, no crazy, you know, 200% gains part of the, and, you know, but at the end of the day, we have, you know, higher end stuff from golden. It feels like every, you know, Jason Tatum's, you know, recent stuff, everything is reaching a new all time high. How is this possible? An epiphany that I was kind of thinking about that was a little bit spurred by the LeBron is that it's not that it's just higher end money bags, manipulating and controlling the market. It's just that high end stuff is inherently lower pop and more scarce and lower serial numbered and when expanding that to how can i do it as someone who gets you know middle on cards or even lower end cards i think it's just integral to target stuff that's unique and niche and not you can possibly derive joy from it because if you from a click from a collecting from a flipping standpoint from every near every other standpoint that you can think of this just makes more desirable cards to collect yeah, I, there is so much going on in what you just said. I have so many thoughts going on, but uh, I'm going to start with my, I'm going to just like, I'm going to go from the economic side of things real quick. So for the people, for the people that don't know this, I was an econ major in college and I spent a good amount of time researching like the sociological ap- aspects of the economy. So how um, different aspects of society and what we hold valuable impact the like the economy essentially um so it's a pretty good not, i am not an econ major <laughs> yeah max is a chemistry major but uh so there's a lot of cor- like correlation between what i learned in college and what i noticed in the markets that we see um with cards especially because of how much impact like what the cultural representations of people are impact their card prices um what i am going to notice from what you just said is like is the fact that rare stuff now that the hobby has be- grown a little bit with um you know, with these prices of cards being promoted as like, oh, the new high of this guy, new high of this guy. I think we're seeing a correction in the market where people are just smarter now. First of all, I think people have been around long enough now. The card market has fluctuated enough where people are like, all right, these cards are extremely volatile. Maybe I shouldn't buy PSA. You know, I shouldn't be buying base cards right when they're released. That sort of thing. Um, The other aspect of it is I think that a wealthier side of people is realizing... Hey, I it's actually a safe investment to buy early career rare LeBron cards. Those are just not coming up anymore. You know, they're just not showing up as much anymore because people know they're good long holds. So I think we will see in the next, you know, few years like a slower amount, a less volume of sales of these rare cards of the, the goats from the earlier on in their career. I just think those sales volumes will go down. And that's just, that, a, just yeah. one little a little factoid. The buyer that I bought it from. I think his eBay store account was titled something like one of one cards and, and I, his store had a lot of printing plates and super factors and other one of ones. So just that card, it didn't just surface out of nowhere. It came out of a super collector of scarce cards. Yeah. 
and that's dope first of all uh having that sort of thing but like i think i think that's just like a observation i've had uh going forward um all right uh real quick max what uh what i learned this week uh there's one i there's a couple things i wanted to talk about but I'll, i'm gonna talk about one of them first so we got what the set that i didn't know so max there you've heard me talk about beyonce rookie cards before i think yes. beyonce is an untapped non-sports card market just as the crazy fan base that she has but so she has a 2003 top trumps card which is like a year uh, i think a uk game but those ones are kind of weird cards they're a little bit taller than regular cards they are graded by psa but they are not regular sized um but so this week i figured i found out about Beyonce's first pack pulled card, which is a 2007 Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition set that actually has autos and like parallels and stuff. Um, it's a box. They, it was like you ripped packs. So it's a pack pulled Beyonce set. Um, well, it's not all Beyonce. Obviously, there's other models and such. But uh, that was interesting. I think that those cards could end up, you know, kind of booming. She has a huge fan base. Those cards are obviously very beautiful. Beyonce is great. But uh yeah, that's my weird thing that I learned this week. Uh, 2007 Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Beyonce cards are out there. If you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, I recommend checking those out. They're still very affordable. You can still buy you know, the cards for less than $100 all across the board. Uh, Max, that's a weird shit. But I wanted to ask, talk to you, Max, this week about uh, the Bowman continuity issues that I'm annoyed with lately. Um, so 2013 Bowman draft. We all know the problems with Bowman with like how they they have to put the prospects in their own insert set, basically. And in 2013 Bowman draft, they put a certain amount of guys in this set they called top prospects, which had the normal Bowman logo and included guys, included the first ever appearance on Bowman cards of guys like Judge, Lindor, and Tim Anderson. Uh, Max, do you know about this at all? Do you want me to? Uh, just a correction that it is, that's important to distinguish the adding prospects into an insert set is so that it doesn't have the controversy of prospects and veterans being included in the same MLB license set to where a prospect card is a rookie card. But in Bowman draft, since it is entirely a prospect set, it doesn't, they are not, you know, you were mentioning insert sets, but the base checklist for Bowman draft isn't an insert subset because it's composes entirely of prospects. Yeah. In terms of the logoing, um, I might, memory and knowledge something that i need to learn you know that you're educating me on a little bit in this moment is the continuity of the logo because i know it wasn't just 2013 i think where the logo dropped right it was a few it was just 2013 no no all right so what what okay. i mean by continuity of the logo though because i don't think i said this is like the bowman first logo for someone's first bowman card is not been very consistent in terms Correct. of when it is used in like its use in general by Bowman. So that this 2013 example, what I'm saying here. Okay, because I want to say, I know yeah. Correa and Buxton, I believe also don't have first logos. Yeah, they might be in the same. They might also be 2013. Okay, um, I but, wasn't entirely sure. So what happens with these guys is that their first Bowmans, they don't have that first logo. It just has the Bowman logo. And I uh, think it depends on the recognizability of the card. Um, everyone generally yeah. knows, and also the flagship kind of, not flagship, but the design of the Bowman card itself. Maybe I'm a biased Yankees fan, but I feel that Judge's 2013 Bowman is recognized already as the prospect card. So the lack of the first Bowman doesn't matter. Um, a card that is relevant directly to this is Chris Bryant. And he was intended to be a release in 2013 Bowman product. I believe it was delayed due to him not signing autographs in time. So they didn't include him in 2013 products entirely. 2014 Bowman. He is included with first Bowman logo cards, but as redemptions, 2013 Chris Bryant Bowman cards also exist from 2014 product. So the 2014 intended Chris Bryant first Bowman card has the first logo, but 2013 cards exist without the logo. And that just, and at a time where not as much anymore, but in 2014, Chris Bryant was the face of prospecting and we're just exiting Trout as being the next all time great. All the spotlight was on Chris Bryant, and he had so much mess going on with his cards. Yeah, and uh, I something that is often said about the card collecting world is that it grew not because of any purpose, but be just pure randomness. And I think that that's a perfect example. The uh, poem and tops, like they messed that up. They fumbled that hard. Like Chris Bryant was the face, is like gonna. Pro he could be a Hall of Famer, and 
at the time was definitely considered a future Hall of Famer. Um, and they just fumbled that hard for collectors, I think, doing, messing up that first logo. Uh, I think that they need to do a much better job about consistently making the rules the same for people across the board so we avoid confusions like this. Um, but generally what I want to say is Bowman first probably hasn't been a lot around as quite as long as some people think it has. And like the consistency and the continuity with it just isn't really there as much as people might think based on the demand for some of the cards. So um, that's just another reason why I'm not a huge fan of collecting Bowman. It's just not super easy to do. Um, it's a little confusing, but uh, shout out, shout out Bowman, shout out guys that do know Bowman and shout out the people that are going to correct me for saying something wrong probably in this podcast. <laughs> Um, so that's what I learned about this week. Uh, the weirdness of early 2010 Bowman, I think, is just something. If you ever bored and want to look into some weird stuff, uh, that's something you could look into. They also did a bunch of stuff with like USA Baseball firsts and stuff, which I think Bregman might be a guy who has one of those. Uh, Harper, mm-hmm. I know for sure. Um, and then Tops lost the license for USA Baseball. Yeah, I, I want to that- say 2014. Yeah, I think 2014. Because there was a couple years where Panini was making USA cards as well as Tops. They still make you Oh, alongside Tops? Yeah, because there's 20, okay. 2012 Prism has USA baseball cards as well. Which You're um, right. So. And, but now it's just Panini Stars and Stripes, which I think is a very underrated product and one to always look at if you like prospecting, not necessarily out of value. But Team USA cards, still cool. I am a fan. Yeah, I... Uh, that's actually we can talk about that another week like, just because like i think it's a little bit similar to the minor league stuff they were talking about but with way more of like the memorabilia autos i think it was there's another aspect to it that's a little more interesting um but yeah so this week i bought a lot of cards max i bought a f- shit ton of cards uh i want to give a quick shout out though to a homie of the a friend of the podcast uh at kawaii guy on twitter uh he gave me some he sent me a little fun trade package with a we got a little out of 25 marshawn lynch patch rookie crusade uh Nice little three-color patch. I'm not exactly sure where this is from, but from his time on the Bills. Sweet card. Uh, we got a little hollow clay, a little swirl arama clay, uh, another Marshawn rookie, an illiterate uh, out of 49 Wiggins, and a nice hollow stuff. So shout out to Kawhi guy. He's one of the best collectors of basketball out there in the world, I think. Uh, he has – he probably – I mean, I'm not sure about value, but in terms of, like, diversity of collections, his Kawhi, Kawhi Leonard collection is – about as good as it gets when it comes to basketball collecting. I highly encourage you guys to follow him. Uh, he He's a guy that we always are talking because Kawhi and uh, Clay Thompson were the same draft class, so that ends up being uh, something where we're looking for similar cards together a lot. Uh, so shout out him. Uh, I'm going to have a, I bought a lot of cards on my birthday this week that uh, will be coming in next week, so I'll save those for next week. But so trying to give a shout Tommy. Uh, shout, no, nice. Birthday shout out to Tommy. Shout out, shout out, shout out. But uh, yeah, I want to give a just Kawhi guy, great guy. Um, I we are always doing trades. Definitely reach out to him if you have any cool Kawhi Leonard cards that are rare. Uh, Max, at, you buy at, anything? At the Kawhi guy. At the Just, Kawhi guy. Yeah. Yes. All right. Cool. Uh, shout out him. Max, yeah. you got any cards you bought this week? Um, cards that I bought this week. Um, a few that I've mentioned in the mail days that are finally in hand that are very cool. Uh, I picked up this. I hope this is picking up right. This Ichiro Gold Glove White Chrome Refractor out of 660 from 2000, think, 2007 tops chrome 2007 tops i do not have the ability to recognize that offhand of the year and cards like this of each row pujols jeter ortiz of the mid 2000s parallels they are affordable for near everyone so i encourage if those are players you like to go out and collect them because they're not stuff people are actively searching they're rare I, as hell. Yeah, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this, but this John Cena Atomic from 2014 WWE is sick. Yeah. I love it. It looks it, great. It is a cool card that instantly generates conversation. It's also your uh, favorite year of tops, right? It is my favorite year of tops, although I can't not say I've ever opened 2014 WWE wrestling. It is my favorite general baseball release of tops. Yeah. And this true gold third year 2020 Juan Soto gold refractor out of 50. I really like this card maybe because I'm priced out of some of his other gold refractors. It's a fantastic image. I had to pry this away from a three feedback eBay seller uh, (laughs) who is primarily selling sneakers, but the card did reach my possession and that is what is most important. And it's not leaving. I don't know. That card is sick. Uh, I know you've been on a gold refractor hunt lately. Uh, That's a cool one to pick up. Uh, but 
you forgot to tell us about, or I forgot to ask uh, you about what you did this week. I went on Wednesday night. Um, so Bleaker Trading is a local card shop in New York City. I am based on Long Island and on occasion when I'm really needing a fix. And also when I'm looking for more cardboard people to meet, to talk to, to trade with, I will take the LIRR from my home, which is about you know five minute walk, you know, even shorter drive. I will take two trains, get myself to Penn Station, and I will walk over to Bleaker Trading if they have an event. This past week on Wednesday, they sp- had a sponsored event or mashup with Loop the App, which is a breaking app, kind of like whatnot. I think Loop was first, but where you join live breaks and they were giving some credit at the door. So I will be joining breaks on their dime. I will be enjoying every minute of it because it won't feel like an expense. And what I found most interesting from the event was that it was branded a collector's showcase. A lot of people coming to Bleecker, I'm thinking showing off their collections. I'm whipping my backpack with two binders, two PC binders, all of my Glaber Torres slabs, and also some of my more fluid moving slabs and cards that I would trade away. And one thing that I was a little bit disappointed by, not necessarily to Loop or Bleaker's cre- uh, discredit, is that it was just a normal trade night. It was just a general people trying to win deals. Of course, there's the average, there's the usual networking and talking and socializing aspect, but no one was showing off their PCs. This wasn't an event to show off my PCs. And if I'm given any opportunity to talk about my Glaber Torres slabs or my Luis Severino rainbow, I'm going to take it. <laughs> yes, and we we spent a lot of time this week talking about that idea of a collector showcase, and uh, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm down to tell people um, we want to start emphasizing that as something that maybe we can help with. Uh, I think there's not enough spaces right now to show off your collection is another reason why I think LUDX is going to be a cool thing for people to have on their phones. But um, what me and Max are going to start doing is having, if you are interested as a listener of the podcast and showing off what you have, your collection, and maybe you don't want to go through the effort of, you know, starting your own YouTube channel or something, uh, me and Max are going to, if you are interested in putting out a video on our YouTube uh, we're going to do a little collector showcase section where we show off anyone's collection they want. We'll tag you. It'll be your thing. And uh, we just want to have another place where people can show off what they are pr- have to put in a ton of work to collecting. And I think I know it's hard in a live event like that because people do want to make trades. It's very rare to be in a space where you can make in-person trades and deals without the fees and stuff. So um, I don't blame them either. S- send us your pictures. Send us your description, why you think it's cool, because... I will assert that I know more about Glaber Torres cards than 99% of all collectors. I can guarantee you Charles, who we just had on, knows way more about Cody Bellinger and Corey Seager memorabilia and cards than I could ever dream of. And everyone has the accessible ability, especially when it's someone that they're interested in, to deep dive in their collector or player or type of card of choice. And the amount of knowledge that goes into it, I just love hearing people's stories and not only why they go for a certain player, but each player's technicalities and special cards and why they stand out and why the commoners that aren't specialized in that player wouldn't otherwise know. Yeah, that's that's what it's all about, I feel like. Just knowing knowing these niche facts about your guy that you collect and being able to share that stuff with other people and being able to draw comparisons and have relatable experiences to collecting some other person and all the connections that that happen with collecting is that's what it's all about. do you have anything else you want to talk about, Max, before we uh, sign off here? I know this has been a fun, fun episode. I can say that time flies, I, and I enjoyed all the topics we talked about this week, and I love Charles both for all the work that he's done for the podcast as well as having him as a guest here today. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, you know, we, we'll probably do a couple of weeks without a guest now, but uh, I, we really wanted to have him on because of, you know, the effort. He, he put in a lot of time and work into our logo, and I think, I think it looks really dope. And what I mean, that's what cards are about. I would love a card that looks like that, the logo we have. You know, as 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 people that are into cards, we have a little bit of thoughts on how uh, graphic design look. And I've never looked at anything Charles makes and not thought it was very dope. So. Uh, when we're professional networkers and we have business cards, we this is taking up a lot of the business card. Oh, <laughs> the young old heads business cards. Wow. Yes, I'm not a I'm not a businessman. I'm, I'm, I'm not man. either, but I need to show off the. No, I was I was saying a Jay Z lyric, dude. Come on, I picked up on it. <laughs> um, well, whatever, man. My brain is dead. This is a good week. 
Thanks for talking to me, Max. This was fun. And we'll be back next week. Uh, I'll be recapping the Ship Shawana show that I'm going to tomorrow, uh, which will be fun. And then whatever else pops up, man, it's going to be it's going to be another week of cards, right? Cards, cards, cards. I believe so. I believe I have another bleaker event lined up from mid this week. I'm not sure if I'm going to make the train commute or not. And I think I have a show Saturday or Sunday morning, maybe both. So I'll be giving recaps of both and what my adventures of that will be. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, I, next week will be electric as always. Well, uh, we'll see you guys then. Sayonara.